In recent weeks, we've been talking a lot about faith in sermons on Wednesday night in our new study with the new book entitled Construction in Progress, Building a Better Christian, One Project at a Time. Our first project has been faith, building faith, one project at a time. So we've been talking about that for a while, a couple of weeks. And that's leading up to say, faith is our subject before us this morning. And as we look at the sermon subject, I want to express to you this graphic. It says a thousand words. Just looking at it, it tells you a lot. But I want us to emphasize what it's saying so that we can focus on the subject that is before us. Faith under pressure. Now when you look at that graphic, you may not think that's me, but that is all of us, every one of us. If you're alive and you're living in 2023, your faith is under pressure. It may not be severe, it may be bad, it may not be so bad, but it is under pressure. And so when we look at this subject, that kind of pressure upon faith is caused by a lot of different things. And we're not going to talk about all the causes this morning. We know what they are as we meet them from day to day. Problems, uh, difficulties, uh, health. Even time itself can exert pressure on our faith can begin to press upon it so that it becomes a little bit difficult. But it always, but in, in our time, every day, pressure upon faith is getting worse, getting greater. And what I'm suggesting this morning is that this is a matter that we cannot ignore. You cannot ignore this. You cannot just say, ah, oh, that'll go away, because it won't. Or it doesn't have to be dealt with, because it does have to be dealt with, absolutely. And so we need to bring it to our attention in a way that is practical, useful, and helpful and edifying to us in, in every way. So it's a matter that we're saying this morning in our presentation of this material from the Bible, that it's a matter of pushback. That's a good way to think about it. Your faith is under pressure. It's, it's, it's pressing down, it's pressing in. It's, there's a great deal of pressure to remove it, to crunch it, to destroy it, to cause you a lot, to, to do a lot of different things in your life and walking away from it, that you would even quit serving God. So it always requires pushback. Pushing back against the pressure. And so we want to talk about that and I hope in the next few minutes in this concise presentation of this subject to give us enough information, knowledge from the Word of God to be helpful, to know what the Bible teaches and to be able to use it. If we want to, if we want to go to heaven, we have to push back against pressure upon our faith. I'm going to answer a question first. And that is, this pressure upon our faith is pressuring our faith to do what? What is it pressuring our faith to do? Well, we could go on and on with an endless list of detail, detail, detail. You know what it pressures you to do in your life. And you are very much aware of that in a very personal way every day. But what I have done for our consideration together is to condense all of these details into four words. And I'm suggesting to you, while these four words will not cover, that's, that's not our claim that will cover every single detail represented by everyone here, no. But it will cover enough of what is common to us 
what you share, what I share, what we all experience in these four words. And they're words that are understandable, and they're words that can be remembered. And so by remembering these four words, you can recognize, hey, that's a pressure upon my faith that has been exerted upon me by Satan himself. He's pushing against me. He's trying to push me off the cliff <laughs> so that I spend eternity with him in hell. And we have to push back. But to do what? One of those things that he is pressuring us to do is to compromise. I think we all recognize that word and know what it means. Sometimes it's good to compromise. Sometimes that's the way problems are settled in a good, fair manner. But we're not talking about something of that nature. We're talking about something that has to do with our relationship with truth, our relationship with Christ, our relationship with the church. It means to make concessions. Hey, I'm gonna, I'll step back. I'll let you have the point, the ground. I'll concede. So to give up, to give in, or to yield to Satan on any point that is pressuring or pushing against us is a compromise. Now, while it's good to compromise in some things, in some problems, you, we have all done that in a lot of different levels, but it's never, and I underscore, never right to compromise spiritually. To give up ground, and sometimes people compromise so much that they even quit. Just quit. That's compromise. And it's occurring in varying degrees in a lot of different lives. The second word of these four is the word please. I suggest to you that one of the things that Satan is pressuring you to do, pushing upon your faith to cause you to do, is to please people. Let's keep it in one word. And what we mean by that, of course, I think we all can recognize. It means he is pressuring our faith to do or not do something. Sometimes it's doing, sometimes it's not doing. <laughs> so that people will like us, so that we'll please people. We'll get approval from people. But other times it means to avoid disapproval. We don't want people to think it to dislike us. We don't want people to think bad about us. We don't want people to walk away from us. We don't want people to not want to be around us. And so we recognize that sometimes pleasing people is a good thing. Paul teaches this specifically in Romans 15 too, that we ought to please our neighbor for edifying. But what we're talking about here is pressure upon our faith to please people when it takes precedence over pleasing God. Sometimes we're in that very situation. I can either please this person or I can do what God wants me to do. I can either please them or I can do what God has commanded me to do. Choice. Very clear choice. Please people. And that's a pressure. But we don't want to do what's going to cause displeasure. We don't want to cause them to dislike us. We don't want to, but wait a minute. That's Satan putting pressure upon our faith to cause us to putting pleasing people above him. And that's wrong. That is wrong, folks. But that's one of the one word that can happen. We can find ourselves in that situation just about on any given day as we relate to people. The third of these four words is the word minimize, recognized by everybody. But we know what it means to minimize something. It means to make it smaller. And that's what we're talking about here, making our spiritual activity less and less a part of our life even to doing nothing. Now that, again, is a varying degree 
of minimizing. Sometimes we just quit. We're not reading the Bible as much. Or maybe we're not praying as often. Or we're not going to church as much. We're not going to Bible class as much. We're minimizing, minimizing. Min and sometimes that happens, and we're not even aware. And before we know it, like a lot of people have that we could identify, have quit and are doing absolutely nothing because they have been pressured to minimize and quit. So that's one way Satan works on all of us. Do less today. Don't worry about serving Christ today. You don't have to be concerned about that. You can do less and less. Don't kid yourself. You may think that, but he doesn't. The last word is the word conform. I think this represents a lot too. What Satan is pressuring our faith to do is to become like his world. He wants you to be like them. He wants you to be like him. And so we look at what Satan is and what his followers are in their lives. He puts pressure on your faith. Hey, I'm going to push on you till you become like me. Or at least to some degree, as much as I can make you become like I want you. And so this is just to adapt to prevailing standards. We know the prevailing standards, the popular standards in the world today, are not Bible standards, far from it. But I have on the other side some things for us to think about. And this actually covers maybe several of those four words. But this culture in 2023 is pressuring your faith. You know it, I know it, and that's why we call our attention to it and say we have to push back. If we want this church to survive, we have to push back. If we want ourselves and our families to survive, we have to push back. What about this culture? <laughs> Don't expect me to have an endless list of things, but I've got a pretty complete list of what represents our culture in 2023. You will recognize those things as qualities and characteristics of what's happening in the world, the world in which you live, the world in which you work, the world in which you go to school, whatever we do, it is a culture of global unrest, our own unstable government, our own um, standards concerning marriage and same-sex uh, uh, same marriage, I'll get that out, has been legalized by civil law. I mean, it's legal. What's, what's wrong with what is legal according to civil law? It violates God's law, that's what. <laughs> so that's a pressure. We can't even do everything that's legal because it violates God. Sexual immorality, the rule of the day. Blatant dishonesty, lying almost expected anymore, to the point where what can we actually believe anymore? Illegal drug use, fentanyl and killing so many different people, immodest clothing, we see clothing that you see some of these designs and fashions and styles that are worn, that are sometimes pictured not that we all go where we're going to see this often, but it's out there. We're almost nothing is covering anymore. Immodest clothing. Paganistic qualities. We call that neo-paganism. You take the paganism of Greek Roman culture in the first century and bring it over to the 21st century in October of 2023. It's just a new form. It's a neo form. You see some of the things happening, and that's exactly abusive violence. It's not our purpose to go down that list of detail of that, but just in recent days, it's raised its ugly head. The 
the shooting in Maine, killing 18 people, injuring 13. There, I think just last night there was a shooting in Tampa, Florida, killing a number of people. So it just keeps happening. Violent, abusive, murdering violence is a rule of the day. Thankfully, we have enough substance and structure in law enforcement yet <laughs> to try to manage this, but we know what's happening in that thing. But it's not my purpose to make us feel negative about our, it's just reality. It's the way it is. It's the fact of the matter. But it's where our faith lives so that you and I might go to heaven. And we cannot go to heaven by conforming to that. We cannot go to heaven by minimizing our service to Christ because of that. We can't do that. Of letting the church go, quitting the church, or minimizing our attendance at church simply because things are so bad. It doesn't, it doesn't work. That will not get us to heaven. And so, to do what? I think if we remember these four words, compromise, pleasing, minimizing, and conforming, you will have covered most things that you're going to encounter where Satan is coming at your faith to try to crush it, to try to push it out of your life. And what that does should prepare you for a stronger faith so that we can do what we said must be done, and that is push back. Now I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes now on this matter of pushing back. And I don't want you to think I'm gonna stand here and give you my opinions about that or my suggestion. Here's what I think you could, no, that's not where we're going with this. Where we're going with this is where God has taken us. And all I'm trying to do is to give us what God has said about what he wants us to know about what he has taught us about pushing back against pressure upon our faith. And that, as you might suspect, is found in a lot of places in the New Testament. But there's one book, one epistle where it is concentrated. And I'm gonna show that to you. You can take it with you when you walk out of here if you're carrying your Bible, because it is written by the Apostle Peter. First Peter is so helpful, so useful, practical in giving us instruction on what God wants us to do to push back against this pressure. But think about the Apostle Peter, how he personally pushed back. You remember when Peter his faith was under pressure. He said, Lord, I'll never deny you. <laughs> the Lord said, oh, yes, you will. You'll deny me before that rooster crows three times. And he did. His faith was pressured to where he denied the Lord. He later regretted that. His eye contact with the Lord, you remember that account? Brought tears to his eyes. And he remembered that the rest of his life. But he let Satan pressure his faith. But he pushed back. And he became one of the strongest apostles, advocates of serving Christ in the New Testament, along with Paul, of course. But where we find most of what he said is in 1 Peter. So I suggest to you to follow with me. It's going to be a quick survey of 1 Peter, where you can take your New Testament home any day this afternoon or any day and sit down and take more time to read these passages. But I would suggest to you that this starts in chapter 1 and verse 3 through verse 12. And what Peter is talking about here is blessing God because he has begotten us again unto a living hope 
But he ends up in the 12th verse, and the, the end result of that learning from that passage is God has given us a pushback. And that pushback is a strong desire to receive the end of our faith. Our faith is being crushed, pushed against, I should say. But what's going to help me push back? Hey, that faith that's being pressed upon, a faith that's being pushed aside, has, a, has an outcome. Peter uses the word end in some translations in my 1901, but it means outcome, goal. So if you have a desire, you have faith right now, if you have a desire to actually have in your possession the outcome of that faith, you gotta hang in there. <laughs> you gotta push back against pressures. And that's what Peter has us doing here in chapter three, chapter one, verses three through 12. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. That's what Peter means and puts it in so many words. Then continuing in the first chapter, verse 13 through 25, some memorable parts in that passage, but Peter talks about having our hopes set, talks about our purity, talks about the preciousness of the blood of Christ that obtained our redemption. But in verses 21 and 22, Peter said, so that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing you have purified your souls in your obedience to the truth. Now that happened to you when you obeyed the gospel. By the blood of Christ, your soul was cleansed and made absolutely pure. You wanna keep that? You wanna maintain that? Well, we're not sinless, we're not so perfect that we never commit sin, but we are of a mind to maintain that purity as best we can by avoiding sin, and when we do sin, to seek forgiveness. And so that determination to keep your soul pure, and by the way, that's the only way it can get into heaven, because there's not a single sin, Revelation 21, not one will enter heaven. So you can't have just one, when you approach the judgment seat. So that determination, I'm gonna keep my soul pure. I'm not gonna let Satan pressure my faith to destroy me. Chapter two, where the apostle begins that instruction in the first chapter by putting away those bad things from our life in order that we may like a newborn babe with that same kind of desire, long for the spiritual milk, which is without God, that we may grow thereby unto salvation or in respect to salvation. So I have a desire for that faith to grow. That's what God wants. That's what he expects. So I cannot stand by while Satan is crushing it and let that happen because I want it to do just the opposite. I want it to grow. In chapter two, beginning at verse five through verse 12, the apostle Peter goes into a series of passages, some quoting from the Old Testament. You all need to remember who you are. Have you ever said that as a parent to your child when they're, remember who you are now, you're going out this may be the first time they've driven, first date or something of that nature. Remember who you are, what name you have, who you represent, and a lot of different things. Well, that's kind of what the Apostle Peter is doing in this passage. Folks, when you feel that pressure crunching down on your faith, remember who you are. Remember that you are living stones that God has used to build up a spiritual house. Remember that you are a holy priesthood. Remember that you are an elect chosen race. Remember that you are a royal priesthood. We talked about that a few weeks ago, answering the question, do we have royalty? Yes, we truly do. We're a holy nation and we are a people for God's own possession. So all of that is to say, when I feel my faith being 
pushed aside, treated disrespectfully by the world and by Satan. I've got to remember, hey, I'm a Christian. And as a Christian, I'm special in God's sight. I'm special in my relationship to the Lord. And this is the way he lets me know who I am, who you are as a Christian. Chapter 2, verse 12 through chapter 3. Maintaining Christian decorum in all areas. He starts with civil government. Be obedient, civil government, yes. Even in the first century against those evil Caesars, Roman emperors, Christians were taught you've got to be obedient to civil law. At work, Peter deals with this by talking about the relationship between master and servant. And this comes as a leading part of this paragraph in verse 18. Servants be in subjection to your masters with all fear. And that translates, of course, into our daily work relationships. Boss, employ, em, worker, employer, employee relationships. Christian decorum. Acting like a Christian. Talking like a Christian. There's never a time, never, whether at work, at home, or wherever it may be, for you to act like you're not a Christian or talk like a Christian should never talk, never. That's your faith being pressed upon. And so maintaining Christian decorum in all areas, in the home, and he deals with the chapter 3, in like manner you wives be in subjection to your own husbands, Verse 7, you husbands in like manner dwell with your wives according to knowledge. So there are very specific instructions for Christian decorum in home marriage relationships. In the church, finally be all like-minded, compassionate, loving as brethren, tender-hearted, and humble-minded, not rendering evil for evil. And then at the end, of this, in beginning at verse 13. Who is he that will harm you if he be zealous of that which is good? Even if ye should suffer for righteousness sake, there's Christian decorum when the going gets tough, when you start to hurt, when there is suffering. There is the right way and a wrong way for a Christian to act. And what the Lord is expecting when that faith is being pressed upon and trying to get you to act in a wrong way, we're going to push back and maintain our Christian character, behavior, identity, 24-7. And that's a part of God's pushback. Chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, going through verse 19. The first verse is very clear. It sets the tone for the rest of it. For as much then as Christ suffered in the flesh, arm ye yourselves with the same mind. What's God teaching you? Well, you're suffering, yeah. You're having some problems, yeah. Part of life, yeah. You want to go to heaven, yes then what is my pushback against the pressure from the world? I'm to arm myself, according to this verse, with what I call the mental toughness of Christ. He was mentally tough. You say he was God. Well, that wasn't a part of the picture of his being a man and him experiencing and suffering all things like you suffer. Tempted in all ways that you're tempted as a man. He armed himself with a mental disposition and attitude that caused him to be able to continue to push against Satan. Chapter 5, the first eight verses. Placing ourselves in God's care. That does make sense when we come to this. You think, well, that has to be a part of this somewhere. Well, when you read through 1 Peter, that's what Peter begins to teach us in chapter 5. You will remember that in verses 6 and 7, 
Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your anxiety upon him, because, why? He cares for you. He cares for us, yes. He cares for you as a person. Push back against that pressure upon your faith by placing yourself under God's care, under his mighty hand in all humility with alertness against Satan. The very next verse, that's verse 8, which we don't have quoted because probably most can remember its content. Because what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober, be watchful. Your adversary as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. A roaring lion is a hungry, devouring lion. And he's walking about seeking to devour you. So we have to be on our alert because he, he, he can pressure you just a little bit each day, you know, it's not so bad, just a little bit today, a little bit tomorrow, but before you know it, <laughs> we've given in, we've compromised, we are pleasing people, we are conforming to the world, we have to push back. And then finally, at the end of 1 Peter, he says, withstand, knowing that you're not in this fight alone, it's not just you, <laughs> It's not just us. There are Christians like us all over the world, all over this country, all over the countries around the world. And some having a lot more trouble than we're having, a lot more difficulty, a lot more pressure upon their faith than we're having. But what is Peter's instruction to push back? Withstand it. Withstand it. Don't quit. Don't give in. Don't yield. Don't compromise. Don't walk away. Don't concede. Stand for the truth. Never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Never be ashamed of the Lord. Never be ashamed of his church. Whom, that is Satan, that roaring lion. But this is verse 9, the very next verse. Withstand. Steadfast in your faith. Use that faith to withstand him knowing that the same sufferings are accomplished in your brethren who are in the world. So Peter does remind these Christians in the first century who were now scattered throughout what we know today as Turkey. They were scattered throughout those provinces. Then, under the Roman Empire and all the pressure that that put upon their faith, that's what this is being written to. And so we look at our lives today. Let's push back using God's pushback. I want to close these few comments today on this subject by identifying our platform. Is this some human teaching? No. It's taken from what we just read, what we just studied, what you can read over. But a platform is someplace where people stand, literally, figuratively. People stand on a platform. Well, what do I mean by this? is where we're standing spiritually, what we stand for here. We've got to be together on this. We've got to be a church in unity on this, having a common goal for this. Recognition of pressure, let's recognize this is true. You say, well, you don't have to convince me of that. I know that very well every day. Well, well good, I'm glad you recognize that. We are to withstand by using God's pushback, not a human reasoning, not a philosophy. Sometimes people rely so heavily upon a positive thinking philosophy. If we just think positively, it will, well, that may help. But it's not God's way of pushing back against pressure upon our faith. So we withstand by using God's pushback. We function with strength from Christ's example. Notice when you read through 1 Peter, how often Peter makes reference to Christ and his suffering. Christ's second coming is looked to for the end of our faith, for the goal of our faith. 
we know when that's going to happen, and that's what Peter said in the first chapter, that, that, that when he comes and when at the revelation of Jesus Christ, that here's the way the passage puts it. You may be found by him under praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's his second coming. That's when he is going to appear. When the world is going to end, when judgment is going to occur, the dead have been raised and all are going to be gathered before the judgment seat and we're going to spend eternity somewhere. You want to be found under praise. You want to be found under honor. You want to be found under glory in Jesus Christ. So that's what Peter has been doing all through the thread of thought in 1 Peter, taking us through this in order that we might be able to withstand through love and unity, we help one another in this fight. Peter has brought them together. He should bring us together through this passage, not through some human ordinance or human law or human carnal attraction, but through basic love of God, love of Christ, love of his church, love of truth, and love of one another. We want it to work. We want this church to be strong. We want this church to consist of strong families, strong individuals who are strong in Christ, who are living their life in service to him and dealing with pressure that is upon their faith. I told you that graphic would represent and say a lot with a lot of words just looking at it. That's happening to your faith right now to some extent. To some extent it is because you're alive in this culture, in this world, your faith is being pushed upon. To what degree is entirely up to you. And that's determined by how much you're able to push back. We're going to sing this invitation song and there may be someone present in this audience today that desires to respond to the invitation of the gospel of Christ. We stand ready to help you. If anybody desires to be restored back to faithful service by going to God in prayer for forgiveness of sin that has been committed, we stand ready to help you. Let us know while together we stand and sing.